Greetings to all of you who have gathered for this Women's Super Breakfast Meeting to discuss widening leadership in financial services in Aotearoa. Warm greetings to everyone. Māori Aho, Māori Tu, Māori Ora Kia Tato, Haumie Huida, Tahi Kia. May our life force awaken and stand tall. Good health for all. Let us join together, unite. We are ready to progress the purpose of us coming together this morning. I'd like to introduce Tracy Cross, mm -hmm. um, legal and business consultant and chair of Women in Super. Good morning, everyone. Isn't this so exciting? It's always good opening the FEC conference with a room full of um, passionate people, and it's fabulous to see some guys here too. So, thank you for joining us. Um, our challenge today is to consider how we get more women into financial services and into leadership positions, but why? We believe our current reality needs some improvement. While the recent Global Woman Diversity Equity and Inclusion Impact Report has female participation in financial services and insurance at around 53%. There is a substantial difference between representation in non-management and more senior roles. One of the interesting things is that of those um, directors, 150 are called, you hear this all the time, don't you? John, David, Mark, Paul, Peter, Michael, Andrew. There are six Allisons, so maybe, maybe that's one of the solutions to change our name to Allison. <laughs> But this is a positive conversation and we need more women in leadership because it's the right thing to do because it's about diversity of thought because we need to ensure that financial products are established, structured and managed, um, taking into account our unique challenges. Um, we need role models to encourage other women to come into the industry. And hey, look, it's all about enhancing business performance. We know that diverse executive teams, etc., do a lot better um, than companies without you. Well, it's just the right thing to do. So, as I said, this conversation is positively focused. It's not only sort of looking at what we can do within the industry, but what we can maybe think about with regard to ourselves and, you know, the own barriers that we might have to our own success. So, this isn't this is a problem we're throwing it at industry stores. This is a this is us all coming together to actually look for solutions. And I love um, this poem that I just came across when I was uh, on my way back from Christchurch. I do not wish to change the past, it made me who I am today. I only want to learn from it and to live in a new way. And I think that that's um, a real positive start to this conference, how new beginnings, how do we take things forward. So how we're going to run this morning's session is that um, our speakers are going to share their views and experiences um, for the fifth for the first 15 minutes, and then we're going to open up for a general discussion, um, finishing at 8.15 with a thank you wrap up, and then we'll have you all off to the conference. Um, so on that note, I want to introduce our speakers. So firstly, we are very lucky to have Dr Sue Watson. Um, so Sue is a professional director and leadership development expert. She's the joint owner and co-director of Leaderful, um, a company that aims to increase the number and diversity of women leading for Aotearoa. They have a mission of getting a thousand more diverse women into leadership positions by 2025. So what a fabulous um, mission to have and great synergies with what we're looking at um, talking about today. Uh, her partner Jane is here. Where are you Jane? So it's so great that we've got you um, both here and I'm quite excited because I think that there's some things that we can do with them as a group moving forward. Um, and we have our very own Anna Marie Lockyer who needs no introduction but I'm going to anyway. The mother, proud mother of three growing teenage daughters, the founding general manager and chief executive of AA Money. We know there is no doubt that Anna Marie is passionate about financial literacy, savings, um, and retirement outcome for New Zealanders and closing the retirement gap while empowering women in our industry. So it's so fabulous to have you both with us today. So you have the opportunity to uh, put your questions through to the speakers. 
any stage uh, throughout the discussion, so on the FSC app that you've been given, um, just pop on there under speaker Q&A, choose the crystal, uh, one room from the drop down, enter your question and fire them through, Prue's going to pick those up and we'll um, t um, present those to the speakers when we are um, in the discussion. And final point um, before I leave the stage is on your tables you have a questionnaire there. Now look, we know that we're not going to do this topic justice, we have a very limited time. So we'd really like your feedback um, with regard to barriers that you see that you might not have the opportunity to share with us, um, and things that um, might be of value to you moving forward that maybe we could collectively think of um, you know, doing as a group, how we support each other, how we, um, how we rise in the industry. So please complete that, leave it on your table or give it to um, one of the committee on the way out. So look, I'm going to leave the uh, speakers to basically facilitate themselves, which is fabulous, I might sit down and have a cup of tea. Um, but I hope you enjoy the session and um, I look forward to the Q&A, thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, na mihi nui ki a koutou, uh, tēnā koe uh, Philippa uh, Rawako Tracy, uh, ka pai tō kaupapa uh, mō tēnei parakuihi, uh, ina wahine uh, mō tēnei um, industry, <laughs> tēnā koutou katoa. Ko su, tō ko ingoa. So, um, this is good. I, when we were doing the planning earlier in the week, there was a little bit of, oh, we're going to get enough people, you know, who's going to turn up? So look at that. Room is full. That's awesome. Um, and are there, is there anyone wanting a seat who hasn't got one? Because there, there, as we're New Zealanders, there's always seats at the front. You can come down here. <laughs> so um, I have to confess that this is the first time I've actually been on a little stage for about two years because of COVID, but I do do lots of facilitation. And it's sort of, can you please run a two-day women in leadership program online via Zoom? Sure, we all said, you know. I've got very used to that, so I'm not used to being in a room with people. <laughs> so um, we just thought, Anna Maria and I, that we would do something, be relatively informal, a bit sort of chatty, because you've got lots of kind of hardcore presentations during the day, which was fantastic. So this is, this is a kind of kai and kōrero session, a, a chance to hear from you. And we sort of said we'll give you a few more things to snack on, as well as, as, well as the lovely breakfast. Do you want to say a few opening words, Anne-Marie? Yeah, I think um, just to welcome everyone. It's nice to see some Johns and Davids in the room. So it's good, good work. <laughs> and um, we did think about just um, tricking everyone next door, because the room next door was full of men, and we thought, you know what, we might just swap stages. <laughs> Trick you. <laughs> Um, so good morning, welcome everyone, thanks for joining us, it's going to be an uh, action packed couple of days so we're really, really excited to um, kick off with I guess some insights from our experiences, some ideas about how we grow our wahine leadership in the financial services industry this morning. Great, kia ora Marie. Um, we can't start the day today, can we, without acknowledging the amazing female leader that we have all been thinking about over the last couple of days, our Queenie. Wow, what a standard she set though. <laughs> so relax, you know. <laughs> She's a one of a kind, wasn't she? And I do think sometimes that we expect more of our women leaders than we do of our men. And we can set impossible standards for other women and for ourselves. And I really love the inclusion movement at the moment, right? Bring your whole self to work. And the work that Jane and I do, we do a lot of executive coaching with women and um, career development. And we're often saying, you are enough. Yeah. What you are bringing is enough and you need to find a place where that's acknowledged and valued. Can I just um, pick up on yeah. the Queen? So obviously yeah, of course. <laughs> Queen has been an amazing selfless leader and um, you know her passing was really nicely timed with uh, both Suffrage Day in New Zealand and my birthday. Um, but what sort of fascinated me was when I watched the funeral on uh, the night before last and decided to stay up and see a little bit of history and I watched it with my 14-year-old uh, daughter. She was um, watching the procession and watching the hand-drawn cart pull the coffin, and she said to me, Mum, why are there no girls pulling the coffin? And I was kind of like, actually, that is a really, really astute observation because our kids today expect, you know, complete equity in the world. They expect what um, they can achieve, what anyone else can achieve. And I kind of looked at it and said, um, I paused the TV screen and who could I see? I could see Princess Anne, um, dressed in her military garb. And then I could see three um, women in the Royal Navy. 
Um, and she was kind of like, well, it's not really very fair, you know. The Queen was a great leader and she was a lady, so why haven't they got more um, females helping uh, farewell her? So really astute observation and something that's really good to see the younger generation thinking about. Kia ora, Marie. That's a great place to start, actually, because we know, and we had this conversation earlier in the week, we know that talented women, and some of them are your daughters and your sisters, are out there looking at the industries where their talent and what they bring is going to be valued. And so I'm, I'm an outsider to your industry, but I would say, can you be confident in your organisation that when our talented wahine come through, that they look and say, that's a place where I know, that's an organisation where I know that what I bring is going to be valued. So that would be something to consider. So yeah, we, Tracy's very clear. We want you to bring practical um, solutions. We don't just want to talk first. But I did just want to start with, you, you stole our thunder, Tracy, with um, giving the outline of the um, Champions for Change recent diversity report. Highly recommend. So we don't need to repeat that. But I think the first thing I'd say, and um, I'd be interested in hearing Anne-Marie's view on this, is if you're going to tackle an initiative like this, let's face it, this isn't new. I'm a third generation feminist. You know, we've been banging this drum for a while. So I think it's really important that not only you as women, but the leaders in your organisation understand your why for this, to do this work. Because it will cost you money, it will take discretionary effort and time. It will unsettle and challenge you. So you better know why you're doing it and what success looks like for your organisation. That's got to be the beginning of it. And it has to be, what we know from the research, it has to be treated as a business priority alongside any other key strategic initiative that your organisation is undertaking. Anne-Marie, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the why um, is pretty clear, and maybe I can share some examples as we go through this. But you know, I think there's no doubt, and you know, we've heard companies perform better um, when they've got more diverse people at all levels of the organisation. Quite frankly, and you know, maybe I can reflect on um, somewhere where I was pushed outside of my comfort zone in my career, and that was um, very clearly when I was asked to work in the KiwiSaver space at ANZ. Um, why would I want to work in the KiwiSaver space at ANZ? You know, it's not really of interest to me. And it's actually an industry that's full of males. Um, so what am I going to add to it? Um, you know, I did uh, reluctantly accept the challenge, I guess, at the time. And, and what did it give me? It probably gave me um, something that I never thought I would enjoy and be passionate about and became very passionate about. But more so, it gave me the ability, I think, to see a different perspective from the males that sat around the table, both within the organisation, across the industry, and within the industry groups as well. Um, you know, I think if I looked probably at that time in the KiwiSaver industry, fair to say, Kerry, David, superannuation, 90% male. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when I stepped in, I guess as a female, I came with very, very different perspectives, very different perspectives for 50% of the customers. You know, so to have um, a leadership which was tilted so far to one cohort of the customers, or a very small cohort of the customers, um, did make a big difference. And I think you know that allows you to think differently and um, create different solutions over time for people more like you. It's a great point, Anna Maria, because two things out of that for me. One is as well as your organisation knowing your why for increasing the number and diversity of women leading, you also as women and as, as male allies and champions need to understand what your why is as well and how it links, how it links to your purpose. Um, so you've sort of started to get into um, some of the benefits that, that come from um, having a more diverse uh, skill set, or in fact, gender diversity in organisations. What what other ones would you say that you've seen in your time, Anna Maria? Look, I think the other is um, creating gender. Or, so no, it's not just gender diversity; it's ethnic diversity, it's cultural yep. diversity, um, it's all diversity. In fact, it's not about one part of the population driving that change. It's in fact about everyone embracing um, the ability to ensure that our staff look and feel like our customers to get better outcomes. Um, and you know, if I again kind of reflect back on some of the sort of turning points in my career, they haven't necessarily been led by um, female sponsors or mentors. They've been led by male sponsors or, and mentors who 
again, sort of push you out of your comfort zone, um, challenge you to do something that you aren't comfortable with, um, and probably can see something in you that you can't see in yourself, um, and challenge you a bit to kind of get over your little glass ceilings and biases to, to um, try something different and grow in a different direction. And so my challenge out there would be to every male um, in the room, every female that's associated with a male, um, and uh, is to challenge you know everyone to embrace the ability to um, support more people um, into uh, leadership roles and growth within the financial services space. Nice. So that's, um, you know, in your little sort of takeout kite, that's a nice one. And, and certainly with women that we work with, we encourage them, have you got a sponsor within your organisation? And a sponsor is kind of shorthand, somebody who can speak for you when you're not in the room. So a lot of career progression happens um, quite informally in organisations, and I can see some heads nodding. And you will have done it yourself. Many of you are leaders. You know, there's conversations that go, hey, we're looking for somebody who can dot, dot, dot. And it might be a secondment, it might be a special project, it might be a, a, a special assignment. And you want to make sure that when those conversations are happening, and this is for you as women, that you have somebody in the room who knows not only what you're good at and what your capabilities are, but what your career progression pathway is and what you want for yourself, what your definition of career success is and the opportunities that you're looking for to progress that. And as Anna-Marie said, in many cases, those sponsors will be men and ka pai. I That's might, great. I might just jump in there because sometimes, you know, to the point that, um, that Sue makes about you deciding what career progression you want, sometimes you don't know that. Um, and sometimes you have to take a risk. And taking a risk is probably... Um, one of the one of the hardest things to do, but also one of the things that probably gives you the most um, growth, I think. Um, so don't always not don't always think you've got to have a clear um, progression plan, but take take the risk, take the challenge, and let um, others guide some of that too for you. Yeah, nice. And I think that's the thing that um, is taking a risk, but don't do it alone. Yeah, so it's finding um, both other women who can support you in that, but also again men in your organisation who, 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 who get it and there are many many of them right there are yeah look there are many of them I think certainly having worked with a number of men in the industry because <laughs> there are a number of men in the industry um, I tend to find those that have daughters come with a far different perspective in championing and growing females in their organisations than those that don't have daughters and that's just a, you know, that's just a reflection on um, a number of the men that I've had, you know, working with or for or for me in the organisations that I've worked in. And I think it's really, it's a really um, interesting dynamic because I think again, and if I look at some of the comments that come out of my young children's mouths now, they're things that we probably wouldn't have said before, and certainly their sons wouldn't be saying them. So I think they're being shaped very much. Um, by their daughters today, which is again, it's fantastic. So, actually, the, I can't remember it, but there's a piece of I can't remember who did it, but there's a piece of research that shows that male CEOs with daughters are more likely to have gender equity in their leadership teams than those without. So, have a little ponder on that. Um, Obviously, not enough daughters in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, the other thing I think it's a useful point to make is that again, this is these, this is from sort of. Um, conversations, mostly coaching conversations and, and career development conversations that, that we have with women and some of them are saying to us, when I see what senior leadership looks like in my organisation, I don't want it. I don't like the way it looks. And what we're hearing now from what I would call, you know, really visionary leaders, male or female senior leaders, is they are looking for that next generation of talent to come through in the organisations and they're saying we don't want leaders who've led as we always have because the challenges that we're facing as an industry, as a nation, and you would have heard the UN General Assembly speech this morning with the call to action of we are, I know we probably say this every year, but we are facing unprecedented challenges and what we need is new perspectives 
and we need those from men as well as women, but we are looking for a new generation, a next generation of leadership. And I think there's a general um, recognition as well, and I think it's one of the gifts that we got from COVID of understanding that we cannot continue to demand what we have of our leaders at the expense of the well-being of them and their whanau and their hapuri, their community. That is not a sustainable model of leadership anymore. So I want to encourage those women who are sitting there, and there might be some of you now are thinking, look, it all sounds really good, but I actually, I want a life. You know, and, and I've got children as well, and I actually want to see them sometimes. That will be really nice. Um, that we are, there is a sea change that's rolling across business in Aotearoa and globally. And I really challenge you and encourage you to identify organisations where that kōrero is happening and it's genuine. Are you, are you hearing this in, in some parts of the financial services sector, Anna-Marie? Yeah, a couple of points on that. I think COVID has definitely changed the way we operate. I know when I was first asked to move into a senior um, executive role um, in an organisation, I, um, I said no because I couldn't say yes. And the reason that I said no was I was trying to balance my family, I was trying to balance my household, and actually um, the more or less all-male leadership team um, did spend a lot of time after hours socialising um, which, you know, I thought was part of what you had to do as a senior leader and therefore, you know, probably didn't really fit in with my life, uh, lifestyle at the time. Um, but evidently, you know, when I finally got my head around why I, why I said no and then um, said yes <laughs> um, a month or two later, um, you know, that wasn't actually how we roll in a senior leadership team. Um, there is good balance. You can have a life, you can have a family and you can have a job and um, still be supported, but certainly COVID's changed the way we operate. In terms of um, developing, I think, that next generation of leaders, um, there's something for me, again, having... Um, I've got three teenage daughters. They're 14, 16 and 18. And um, I would love one of them to get into financial services. I was an accountant. I wanted to be an accountant from the age I was 10. And then when I became an accountant, I was like, tick, done that, what next? Um, None of them want to. None of them want to study uh, financial services. I don't know if it's because they look at me and think, "Oh my goodness, <laughs> what do you do? You sit in meetings and you talk on the phone and la la la." But um, but the reason they actually don't want to enter the financial services space is because they don't like their business studies teacher at school. And then I kind of go, you know, there's something in that. If they don't like their business studies teacher, if the she, she or he is not going to inspire them or make them passionate about a future industry and a future job, what hope have we got of getting, um, you know, more females into the industry? So my challenge a little bit is around finding inspiring um, educators um, to take them down the fields of, you know, we talk about STEM, we talk about financial services. Um, that's so important if we look to our next generation of leaders. Otherwise, they'll be doing the fun subjects because they like the teachers. Um, and, you know, it'll be more difficult for them to get in later. Speaking as a former teacher, I was <laughs> horrified when my son went into financial services. <laughs> He's a banker, Emma. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, anyway, um, and as a former teacher, I'd also say school doors are open wider than they have ever been, right, to community. And uh, just a, are any of you actually engaging with your school? Because also, let's not put too much on the poor old teachers. Um, I know that schools are really open to people from industry coming in to career days, etc. Have any of you done that? Just, just get us kind of see a show of hands. Yeah, so that's again a thing you can do. It's a great point to make sure that that pipeline of talent, particularly women and diverse women, are seeing that there are real live people, you know, real live women in the industry, and uh, and you can speak authentically um, about the the career opportunities um, that lie there. That's that's a great takeout. Um, just we're about to close in a minute, but the other really simple kind of hack, if you like, for those of you sitting in organisations who are really passionate about this, um, often I say to women, well, do you know what the DNI strategy is, diversity and inclusion and equity strategy is for your organisation? No, there will be one. Um, and, and anyone, any of you in publicly listed organisations, you can have a look at your shareholders report and there'll be some wonderful high and lofty statements about this commitment, which are, will be genuinely held by um, the small but increasing number of women on the board and others. Right, so need, you need to understand the context that you're in and where those big um, policy statements have been made and commitments by your organisation and senior leaders to the co-papa. Right, 
and so that you're again you're not doing this alone you're not having to sit there and go I think we should hear about this your organization I can actually guarantee there probably isn't an organization in the room that do, hasn't made some statements about this yeah. yeah, I think that's a really important point. I'm very fortunate to um, report to a board and to also sit on a board within the financial services space. Um, and when I, jo when I uh, joined, when I started reporting to my board, I had six males on my board. And when I joined the board I'm on, um, I joined five other males um, on our board. So it was, you know, it was quite an interesting dynamic um, as you come again into these new roles in your career where um, the conversations um, have got one perspective. Um, over time, uh, the board that I report to has now got more diversity on it, and the board that I'm on has got greater diversity on it as well. And I certainly have seen um, very, very changing conversations around the table of those boards, um, and certainly, you know, creating um, more than one person of a different um, gender or ethnicity or culture sitting on a board allows for greater, I guess, support and challenge, and the ability for the voice to be greater, gra um, greater heard too. So. You know, I think when you talk about um, D&I being led, you know, in the tone from the top, um, it's no different to our staff matching our customers, but also starting to think about how we create greater diversity across our boards um, to drive that tone from the top. Nice. So do we, I'm, I'm looking at my watch and going, I think we're at the point where we need, yes, we're on strict time, we need to... Uh, respond to questions. Thank you, Prue. Kia ora. You're going to be our mediator, moderator, or something. Okay. You good luck <laughs> moderating us. Um, lots of awesome questions. So I'll start with: um, How do you go about finding a sponsor as a foreigner or newly returned Kiwi, lacking the networks to be shoulder tapped in New Zealand? To getting a foot in often seems quite a big battle. Um, I think joining industry organisations is a great way mm -hmm. to meet um, senior executives and uh, colleagues across the industry yes. um, to help build sponsorship. Um, there's also a lot of other you know, s schemes um, through universities and business schools, again, where you can sort of start to meet people and to mentor and support younger students, but working with a number of sort of colleagues across your industry too. There'd be a couple of tips from me. Yeah, look, um, there's never been a better time to be a woman who um, is not Pākehā, let's put it that way, in Aotearoa. We are looking for diverse talent in every organisation worth its salt should be. Um, another quick hack from me is when I talked about what the DI&E strategy is for your organisation, your organisation will probably have a DI&E committee of some sort, as Anna Marie said, join it. And I can, I'm sure that FSC is more than, more than open doors. Uh, volunteering is a really great way, actually, to build networks and, uh, and to find the people who uh, lean toward diversity and value and appreciate what you bring. So thanks for the question. And sorry, just one more thing on that. If you're looking for a sponsor, find someone not like you. Yeah, nice point. Um, if you want a mentor, find somebody like you. For instance, you know, if there there will be diverse women in the industry who could be a really fantastic mentor for you as well. They are out there. And there's two questions that are kind of related, so I'll sort of roll them together. One's about um, whether you have any commentary on the penalty NZ Rugby was given due to missing the diversity quota on their board. And, as you know, the question is whether this is what it's going to take in some industries. And I think, you know, related to that was a question around we're role modelling and tone from the top. If that's so important, do we really need to force the change? Because that doesn't seem to be happening on its own. Yeah, well, what do I think about the rugby? I mean, what do I think about the rugby full stop at the moment? <laughs> Fair. Uh, um, look, I think, uh, I think at the end of the day, they, you know, there is a step change in the governance at New Zealand Rugby and across a number of sports um, boards and with the World Cups. Um, there's a, the, you know, a really good focus across that everywhere. Um, I think sometimes the only way you are going to get change is by forcing change through quotas, through fines, and that really sends a signal um, to the level of importance um, moving forward. So I think, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it, in fact. Um, yeah, I agree. There are two sports seats being advertised, I think, for New Zealand Rugby at the moment. Just got an email about that yesterday. So, um, yeah, and they, they're trying to do right. I think, I think we need a combination. I think, we, for instance, um, initiatives like Champions for Change, which is voluntary now, probably has 50 of the largest 
uh, organisations in Aotearoa, you know, voluntarily reporting on their DINE. We've got the Mind the Gap initiative, which is again is where you can volunteer organisations voluntarily report on their gender pay gap. But yes, I think we need I think we need some stick as well as some carrot, and we've certainly seen this in the public sector, haven't we, where we've seen um, a much greater increase in the proportion of women on boards and senior leadership because public sector leaders like Peter Hughes and, and um, state, what are they called, public se service commissioners now, aren't they? Yeah, thanks Jane. Um, have, have set very clear targets and held themselves to account for those. Would that be a fair comment? Yes, thank you. But Jane writes and nodding to me in the front row, um, and so I, I, we know that 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 does work. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? I often find myself second guessing myself, and I know I'm not alone when talking to other women, particularly where we are the only woman in the conversation. Yeah, imposter syndrome's real. Um, I, you know, I certainly have imposter syndrome, and I remember walking into one of my workplaces um, pretty much every morning, stopping at the door before I walked in there, taking a big breath and going, right, I can do this. <laughs> um, you know, whether I could or not, I think sometimes, um, you know, we're our, we're our own worst enemies. Um, sometimes we need to take faith in what we can achieve because others believe we can achieve it. Um, and... You know, I don't think I don't think anyone would sit here and go, God, I don't have imposter syndrome about something in our life. Um, it's just something that I think you learn to accept, to grow with, to navigate, um, and put tools and techniques in place to um, hide it when you need to. Nice one. The other thing I'd say, I always think imposter syndrome is a really good sign because it means you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone into the red zone. It's like, yeah. And, you know, sometimes you can be quite playful with it. It's like, yeah, have a seat, imposter syndrome, you know, while I do my presentation. <laughs> um, what is your view on championing, championing diversity but also not being chosen just because of the quotas but because we are capable and competent? It's that kind of pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, I am very big on the right person for the right job. Um, and I think it's, it's incredibly important um, not to just put someone in a role because you're trying to meet a quota. Um, and I know some of the people in my team today would have seen this. You know, I truly believe that diversity around a leadership table is really, really important. Um, but, you know, if you've, got, uh, if you've got three candidates for the role, um, and the male is the best candidate for the role, but you haven't got diversity across your team, and that's if the male is the best candidate for the role. Boily, I saw you look up. <laughs> um, you haven't got diversity across your team, then maybe you reshape your team slightly differently to bring you know, more diversity through into another role in your team. Um, the other thing that, you know, when, we, uh, when I was recruiting for an EA property manager recently, I had three candidates come in, two were male and one was female. And actually, I never thought, goodness, I'll be interviewing some male candidates for an EA role. Um, but, you know, the best person won. Um, and he's doing a great job in that. So, Yeah, I'll just add two other things. One is just a quick, I heard somebody say once, which is if you think you got the seat because you're a woman, take it and then prove <laughs> that you're worth it. Yeah, number one. Um, number two, in terms of what we're looking for, right, and we know that we need to broaden our concept of what merit looks like and I noticed this and I'm on four boards as a professional director and um, you know the, it, typically there's been a lot of you know we need accountants and lawyers and people with you know very particular skill sets which have traditionally been recognised and valued and um, what we're seeing now particularly with executive recruiters who Jane and I work with quite a lot um, is they are very much broadening what they are seeing as um, capabilities and perspectives that add value to a governance or senior leadership discussion. And sometimes if you had a mixing desk of what attributes were valued, we need to dial some up and maybe dial a few down. And that already means that we are more, we are seeing and valuing diversity more. Yeah, and I love what a lot of organisations are doing too, you know, and I think it's really important to get different perspectives when you're recruiting. Um, every every role you recruit for, you should bring some diversity into your yep. recruitment so that you always have um, different perspectives because you may well change um, your thoughts through the recruitment process. So don't interview three people, you know, that look and feel exactly the same. 
Um, that's great. There's one other question about um, homogenization of views. How do we prevent this um, so that female leaders can actually bring an on the female perspective as they progress rather than the same old corporate view? And I think that kind of goes to bringing our whole self to work, isn't it? And the diversity of thought and not just diversity of... Yeah, that's right. And, and, and feeling like you can speak up. Um, feeling you've got the support to speak up, I think, is really important. So, you know, so surround yourself with um, a mix of people, some allies, some people that have challenged you. Um, but certainly, I think, don't be afraid to speak up. If you believe it, say it, is probably what I'd say. Yeah, I also think homogenised. I always think of milk. Homogenisation harms men as much as it harms women. You know, it, it harms Pākehā and Tauiwi as much as it harms tangata whenua because it's not real, right? It's not real. Our culture is not homogenous. We are not homogenous. Our customers are not homogenous, right? And so don't, what's the opposite? Heterit something. Don't know. <laughs> Diverse. Yeah, trim milk. Di oat milk. There you go. Oat milk. Um, so yeah, so those 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 they're harmful monocultures. I think Rob Cameron talks about this. Yeah, he talks about harmful monocultures cultures, not only agriculturally in New Zealand, <laughs> um, in terms of forestry and um, and uh, dairy farming, but he, he he talks he uses that metaphor to talk about board tables and senior leadership teams. So we are imposing a homogeneity that doesn't exist and doesn't reflect reality and will not help us face the challenges uh, that we are all facing. Yeah. I think we've all grown up in organisations which have had quite a degree of that, so it's yeah. sort of moving on from that too. Yeah. Um, another one, men doing more at home or partners discuss. <laughs> um, Look, I can jump in there. Um, when I was going through a little bit of a career crisis about whether I took this job or not, um, uh, and, and I didn't, um, part of it was because there was just so much going on at home. I didn't think I could. Um, I didn't think I could manage work life and the kids. Um, you know, and by the time I found myself a sponsor and they'd talk me into asking myself the right questions as to what I wanted mm. to do in my career, and me realising actually I probably did want to take the next stage of my career. Um, my husband called me at work and said, I've just quit my job so you can take the job. <laughs> so, so then he stayed at home for the next five years um, and um, brought up our three lovely kids. So um, yeah, I don't even know how old they were back then, but um, it was the best thing that he did for all of us as a family. The relationship he now ha has with our children is um, stellar, outstanding. The fact he can now cook meals without just mince in them has also been quite an achievement because I'd give him a recipe book once a week. Once a week, here's a recipe book with a new recipe for you to try. Um, and, you know, he stayed at home with the kids more or less until they started college. And at that point, there was no reason to stay at home because there was nothing to, you know, there was nothing to do during the day. Um, and then he bought himself a business and works part-time and still continues to um, do, you know, um, a lot around the house. Um, he also leaves a lot for me, it's probably fair to say, but look, I think support of your partner, whether they're male or female, um, is just so important to help you balance um, life, um, work and family, um, and everything should be shared responsibility. Sounds great. Any other um, sole parents out there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, actually, think, I think I had it easier in a way, because my expectations were never unmet. Let's just put it that way. But hey, um, you know, what we know though is encouraging men, having parental leave policies which are good for men and encourage men and make sure that men don't suffer the motherhood penalty. We didn't talk about the fatherhood penalty. I don't think there is one. I think it's often different. When men take parental leave, it's like, oh man, he's so awesome, look at him. The motherhood penalty is real in this country and it has a massive impact on retirement savings. As you go through, most women after 10 years never return to their pre-parental leave levels of income. Look at Ministry for Women website, got a lot of great research on that. That is not true for men who take parental leave. So those of you who have the opportunity to influence this, let's create a context where our men have the opportunity to parent 
uh, and take the time away to do that, just as, as, as many women do, and would make a better place for all. Kia ora. Hey, look, thank you all. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sue Watson and Anne Maria, for all of your words. Um, just as I'm making these closing comments, a reminder that they've got those questionnaires on the table. So if something struck you as the conversation has evolved, really love you to just uh, capture those thoughts on the questionnaire and you can just leave them on the table or hand them to us on the way out. Um, Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your enthusiasm and support for this event. Um, it's lovely for me to be here and to see my fellow um, Women and Super Board members, uh, Tracy, uh, Maria, uh, Morvin, Prue, Vanessa, Philippa. Thank you all for uh, your work that you do to enthuse and inspire um, everyone in the industry. Uh, I hope you've all had some you know, aha moments as we've talked. Um, I've just jotted down some thoughts for my personal care days to take away. Uh, check the DNI strategy. Um, in fact, my new organisation doesn't have one, I know. So I think, um, yes, I'm going to write it. Um, make financial services fun uh, was one thing that struck me. Um, and how do we do that? Uh, I think there's lots of different ways. We'll all find our own way to do it, but we're in it because we love this industry and we think it has real value. So how can we support, inspire, enthuse people um, who maybe don't think about money all the time? I always remember Carmel Fisher telling a, a room full of KiwiSaver men that KiwiSaver is a bit boring, isn't it? How do we how do we make it more interesting? Um, so let, that's a challenge. Um, I'm going to forgive myself for not being perfect, um, and I'm going to remember to breathe when I'm feeling the imposter syndrome. So um, thank you for that tip. Uh, and industry organisations love that plug because this is a woman in super event. Um, so we'd love to have uh, you know more women helping us, inspiring, being able to spread the word. So um, thank you for um, generating those thoughts in me. Thank you for all the thoughts that you've hopefully inspired the room uh, for. And uh, thank you all for attending. Thanks.